freedom is worth fighting for. So that is where rejection comes from. That's what it is. Now, what are the results? If this is true, it's the same way as when we did the occultic route. I said to you, the only way really you can know if you're blessed or cursed is to look at your life. And what do you see? And the way in which you know if rejection is a problem is by having a look at the results and seeing any of these ugly little insects crawling all over us. Okay, the first result of rejection is one, in, in no particular order. Um, emotional immaturity. Now remember when we did uh, the Roots of Bitterness, we looked at what emotional immaturity was and how adults act like children, they're just more sophisticated about it. But they'll have tantrums and be very self-centered and so on. And when we have had an issue with rejection, the problem is that we have not grown and matured within ourselves, our souls. And so although we're adults on the outside, within ourselves, we are still children. And our personalities have not formed as they ought. And so it's actually no wonder that some of our behavior is very, very childish, and there's a lack of maturity. Um, but it's symptomatic of the root of rejection. So maturity comes from relationships, and a person who's denied love and acceptance will be immature and insecure. See, it's within relationships that you discover that you are not the center of the universe, contrary to what you might believe. Um, and maturity causes you to think about the other person's needs, not just about your own. And when you have a problem with rejection and there's emotional immaturity in your life, it's almost impossible to have a completely mature relationship with a person because there will be levels of insecurity that cause you to continue, almost play a game, to see if that person is filling your needs. Um, you have a right to be listened to, you have a, a right to all of these things, and you're always looking to have those rights met. But in maturity, if you're a mature person, you can almost fully concentrate on the other person and put yourself out the picture. Um, emotional, social, and spiritual maturity comes from the Father's love and acceptance. And it's not just the, natural, the earthly Father, but the heavenly Father. An unfulfilled need will be projected into a marriage. A girl who's not received a father's love will seek that love in marriage. And that is often the problem in marriages, is that we have girls who go into marriage, or boys who go into marriage, and they actually, they begin to relate to their partner as a parent. They want, they want the approval that, um, for example, a girl would get from her dad. And I remember dealing with a couple one time where there were really severe marriage problems that were ongoing over, over many years. And um, this, this girl, the woman in the marriage, actually said this. She said, my father was a perfect father. And she, she was contrasting her husband unfavorably with her father. And the reality was, was that he was anything but a perfect father. He was actually an alcoholic. And so there was a lot of denial there right away. But besides that, he had never, ever, ever disciplined her. He never disciplined his children, and he let them do pretty much what they liked and indulge them, and so she perceived her father as a perfect father. However, the way this man treated his wife, the woman's mother, was appalling. He would even lock her in the house and not let her out because his jealousy was so extreme. He treated, he treated his wife abominably, and yet he totally indulged his children and would make up for his alcoholic binges by giving them all kinds of things. And I realized this one day while I was speaking to her, and I said to her, 
What you want your husband to do is actually treat you the way your father treated you, but you would have a fit if he treated you the way he actually treated his wife. And this is the man you are married to. He's not your father. So any time her husband ever said to her, there is this wrong or there is that wrong or tried to work through conflict, she perceived that in a distorted light. She saw it that she was being criticized and she was being rejected because her daddy would never do that to her. And this, is, is, and this is the thing, is that people carry things through into their marriages that are actually hangovers from their childhood. And that's why you don't have mature relationships where people can actually act like, like two grown-up people because there's still a lot of, of childhood there. A second result of rejection is loneliness and fear. You know, people who have rejection are often very lonely and they're fearful and they can't communicate or relate to other people well. And the thing that would actually heal them would be to get into a whole bunch of good relationships where they learn to interact with people of various kinds. But the thing that they, that they need is not what they want because they're too afraid of further rejection. So what a person like this will do is try and get one person and have one close friendship and get all their needs met within that one with in that one relationship, but we all need a variety of relationships. None of us can live with just one. We all need a group of people. We need um, people of different types. We need to develop relationships with, with whole groups of people. So, um, so when there's loneliness and fear, you can be afraid to let people get close for fear of further rejection because you're dominated by a fear of rejection. So it's a case of I won't let anybody get too close to me because if I do, they might reject me and then my feelings will be hurt. So it's better to keep them at arm's length. Secondly, um, a person who is lonely and fearful needs warmth and love but what they do is they become really crusty and they'll kind of turn people off. And they're wanting you to break through those barriers to get there and love them anyway. But their, their reaction is to, is to push you away. Um, inwardly, people um, with rejection can be full of insecurity, loneliness, fears, self-pity, vanity, imagination. Um, if you are somebody who sees yourself as a victim a lot, that is a sure and certain sign of rejection. If you see yourself as a victim, everybody else is unfair, everybody else is treating you badly, and it's because of the need within. And outwardly, when there's loneliness and fear, you get two extremes, because some people are just really, really good at hiding what's inside. And so we're gonna look at the right-hand column first, the one extreme, if you have rejection and you, you're lonely and you just wish you could have relationships, but at the same time you're fearful of having them, the, the one extreme is to become very, very competitive, where there's, you, you hide the rejection very well, hide the loneliness, become very aggressive, a striving spirit, a high performer. You have to excel to achieve a sense of self-worth. If you fail, it's just disastrous. And there's a lot of self-rejection. And people like that can be very, very ambitious. I had a friend who had one of the worst stories of rejection of anybody that I've ever heard. Um, it was a it's a friend of mine by the name of Diane. And she was one of a pair of identical twins who was born in Minnesota. And um, she was much smaller than her identical twin sister. And so she was, she was left at the hospital and her mom took home the other twin. And so it was several weeks before she was allowed to go home, and they were a very, very poor family. And when she got home, her mother rejected her. Mother didn't want to touch her, was actually afraid of this very little baby. And so what she did was she put her in a drawer, in a chest of drawers, because they were very poor, they didn't have much furniture. And so she'd pull out the drawer, she'd put this baby in the drawer and leave her there. Wouldn't change her nappy, wouldn't look after her would like to stick a bottle in her mouth, and there this child was left. And the father came home one day and found a rat in the drawer with her. So now there's already this, this intense rejection. But her father was an alcoholic, and as they grew up, he became worse and worse in his alcoholism and became almost insane. And there were about six children in this family, and they would sit around the, the table 
And the father would sit there, and the children would sit and tremble, Diane told me. And she said, um, he would, and he would look at them and require them to like, guess what he was thinking. Why aren't you giving it to me? And they wouldn't know what he wanted. And um, he would want them to pass the salt, but wouldn't say pass the salt. And th it was just a really, really appalling childhood. And she just told me how one time he lined them all up against the wall and pointed a shotgun at them. He said to them, uh, if any of you move, I'll blow your head off. And the little boy in the family did move, and he shot a hole in the wall above his head. Um, when, da when Diane was seven, she didn't close the barn door properly, and so he took a plank and, and hit her across the ribs, broke her ribs. Um, and just, I mean, m just so many awful things I can't even begin to tell you. And then she got into a marriage where her husband nearly killed her, left her in a pool of blood, and, uh, and she had to run from him. But the result in her life was that she became one of the hardest working, most aggressively ambitious people I've ever met in my life. At one stage, she was doing five jobs. And she got, she, over, she, she coped with the intense rejection in her life by working harder than anybody else, achieving more than anyone else, buying more expensive things, being ultra successful. And that was the one extreme because the rejection within her was so extreme that that was the only way she knew how to cope. She actually started working at 12. And then on the other extreme, people who actually can't hide their rejection, they, they, they let it become visible. And these people can become really withdrawn, be very passive, shy, very uncompetitive, live in a dream world. They'll have a totally imaginary concept of who they are, and they don't live in reality. And I, I knew somebody like that as well. Went to Bible college with this guy. And he'd come from um, a poor family in this country and was also suffered a great deal of rejection. But he was engaged to a girl from a rich family, and they paid for him to go to Bible College in America. And they said to him, whatever you want to do, we'll pay for you. If you want to take flying lessons, you can take flying lessons. If you want to go on outreaches, we'll pay for you to go on outreaches. He had absolutely no need of anything materially because his fiance's family were seeing to it. He didn't even last five months. He had absolutely, he wouldn't do anything had no ambition to do anything, said to me, I've got no burden for these Americans. You know, like, when I get home, I'll do. It was always when, 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 and never achieved a thing. Now, you see, those same problem, two reactions, two extreme reactions, do you see? And most of us fit somewhere in between. Some of us cover it up really well, and others just let it all hang out. A third result of rejection is self-rejection where we absolutely, we just reject who we are. We've actually got no self-value. So what we do is we need other people's approval to make us feel good about ourselves. Because we, we don't just feel good about who we are, because we have a strong sense of self-identity. So when we don't have that, uh, when, we, when, when we have a root of rejection, we can then reject ourselves, and it means that in any relationship I get into, I really, really, really need you to compliment me, or I need you to approve of me, and I need to make myself over to be what you want me to be, because I will get my value by the value you place on me. So I've said you become a man pleaser, always seeking acceptance and approval, because you see, if those love and acceptance needs and the needs for worth and so on are not met as a child, and you grow up with these needs within you, uh, you're continually looking to have those needs filled. And it means that in every relationship you get into, you're looking to have those needs filled. So you become a man pleaser. You have a negative self-image, and you accept the rejection of others as indicative of your own worthlessness. And you know, I face this kind of stuff in the church all the time. I'll have people who have got problems with rejection, who perceive rejection, say from me, when it's, I would never, for a start, I wouldn't reject anybody. Simple as that. I would not reject somebody. I would not willfully reject another human being. But people will perceive rejection where there isn't any. And in their imagination, they'll think you're ignoring me 
or the way you looked at me was disapproving, or you never come and speak to me, or whatever, and it's that perception of rejection because of are there being such a negative self-image. Um, people will accept people's evaluation of them instead of their own or God's. You know, God says you're so valuable that I sent my son to die in your place. That is the truth. That's how valuable you are. You are worth more than gold or silver or the universe to God. You're worth the life of his son. But we don't believe that. We don't believe God's evaluation of us. Instead, we want another human being made of flesh and blood and the dust of the earth to approve of us so that we can feel good about ourselves. Um, we compare ourselves to others. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you compare yourself to somebody else, you're not wise. Of course you're not, because you're unique. You're not supposed to compare yourself with other people. You can't compare the way you look with somebody else. And see, in the society we live in, we don't get it. So we look at the airbrushed creatures in magazines, computer fixed up people, and we look at them and then we look at the horrible reality of what we're at, we are, and we go, see, I'm not as good as they are. Um, Adele's mum said something once that I found really funny. She said she put contact lenses in for the first time and looked at herself in the mirror. And she said she thinks it's just the grace and the mercy of God that makes our eyesight get dimmer as we get older <laughs> so that we can't see how awful we look. But, you know, we, we, have, we have this completely false image projected through the media of what it is, like the camel man from years gone by who does all these fantastic adventures and then sits down and smokes and they don't show you him dying of cancer. You know, lung cancer. Um, and, and we see all these people having all this fun. And you look at your own life and you don't have that kind of fun. Or you read a romance novel or you go to an adventure movie. And we live in a world of unreality. And then when our lives don't measure up, when we're not living in a soap opera, we think that there's something wrong and, and we feel boring. Or we, feel, we just feel we're not as good as other people. And that's because we don't have any self-worth. And we can also develop a very critical spirit. We can be critical of ourselves, but we become critical of others. And, you know, when you, when you have this kind of self-rejection, it means that if anybody criticizes you, it devastates you. You take it so personally. You want pe people have to continually compliment you, continually tell you how wonderful you are. You can't take criticism because it, it, it actually affects you and devastates you. So that's self-rejection. A third one is a loss of self-identity. Rejection destroys a person's self-identity. And just a matter of interest, people who have suffered from schizophrenia and people who are in homosexuality, when they've investigated, they've found that they don't, invariably don't have a father image. But you see, when you don't have a self-identity, a strong sense of who you are, you'll go and look to belong to some group. And you get your identity from that group. That is why gangs flourish. In, in areas like in certain ghetto areas in America or in certain areas in South Africa or in any country you, you choose, especially when there's been a breakdown in the, in the nuclear family unit and there's a lot of alcohol abuse and a lot of, um, you know, care, families that have just been disrupted and are dysfunctional. What do those young people do? They'll often go and join a gang because in the gang they have a sense of belonging. The needs that should be met within a family instead are being met within that group. And so their identity is in the gang. And um, it's a real, real problem with teenagers. Because te uh, during the teenage years, it's a time when people are particularly vulnerable to being rejected. And when their self-image is already really being affected by changes in their body, and teenagers are really cruel. And at, at times like that, there's such a desire to be accepted and to find your identity within the group you have to fit in. And so you can get, teenagers can get pressured into behavior that 
they haven't been taught in the home simply because they want the acceptance of their peers. You know, if you know who you are, you don't need to do those things. I watched a program in the last couple of days on Animal Planet on that little girl, Bindi Irwin. You know Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter? His little girl. And he was killed tragically a year ago, more than a year ago. But um, they, showed, they showed footage from when this child was born up until when her father died. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, Steve Irwin, I really hope you're in heaven. Because one thing you were was a marvelous father. And you've given this child such a sense of self-worth and identity and value that she, is a, she really is a whole person. And it's unfortunate that so many Christian parents can't do that because they're more interested in their own needs being met and, and all the issues they're dealing with in their lives that they can't actually build and affirm things in their own children. But here's this little girl. She knows exactly who she is. And you see the time her father spent with her and the way he affirmed her and the way he took her with him, and it was obviously a, just an extraordinary life. But she really knows who she is. And I'll tell you something, that Bindi Irwin will never have a problem being pressured by her peers to do something that she doesn't want to do because she knows who she is. But unfortunately, in, in the society we live in, most teenagers do not have a good enough self-image. They don't have a sense of identity. And so they all want to dress the same and think that they're all being, you know, we look how different we are. We all wear the same brand name. We all go to the same place. We are making a statement. We are clones. <laughs> See, and th that's sad. Because if you know who you are, you can be as different as everybody else, and it doesn't bother you. Um, so you seek identity somewhere. Teenagers and peer groups, sometimes adults in church or in club or in profession. Women, unfortunately, become blank pieces of paper for their husbands to write on. They don't know who they are. So to whoever you want me to be, I'll be that. Um, in one group of minister, at one minister's conference one time, all these women had to get up and introduce themselves. Every single one got up and said, I'm so-and-so's wife. And didn't have an identity to say, this is who I am. I'm actually an individual quite apart from my relationship with my husband, or I'm not so-and-so's mother, or whatever. And, the, when the, and so many people look to marriage to found their identity. But let me remind you that marriage does not endure into eternity. It's for this lifetime. And it's in this lifetime that we've got to learn who we are. And we've got to live our individual unique lives. So, um, fifthly, another result of rejection is an unstable relationship to God. A child who's un... Uh, uh, any child unloved by the father will have difficulty building a stable relationship to God as father. Well, if you never know where you are with your earthly father, why would you think you know where you are with your heavenly father? You know, there's a, it says that we to come boldly to the throne of grace. But if you can't even come boldly to your earthly father because you never know what kind of mood he's going to be in, you've got to read the signals first, or he's going to criticize you or whatever, that is the same trepidation with which you approach the, the heavenly father. And so it creates an unstable relationship. A child who grows up, this is important to know, a child who grows up under rejection will accept rejection rather than love from God. They'll always see God as finding fault with them. They can never please God. A person suffering rejection relates to God upon a basis of works and works hard to become acceptable to God. And that's sad because it means that when we've had a really good day and we've managed to live like Christians and we haven't shouted at the taxi driver and uh, when we spilt the tea, we said, God bless the teacup instead of throwing it in the bin, you know, and we've really acted like Christians and we're so pleased with ourselves and we read the word, and we actually prayed, and we might have even sung a song with the CD player in the car or whatever, and we really feel Christian and holy. Then when we go to God 
We're convinced he's heard us. When are we going to get it? But the next day you wake up and you act like a heathen. Then you don't dare pray. Because you can just say, you can just see this cosmic frown down the corridors of the universe at you. So it's better not to pray that day. You can't live like that. And then the worst, and my personal favorite, a love vacuum. If you have a problem with rejection, you have, will have a love vacuum. And I'm going to share some stuff, and then I'm going to get my friend Bailey Cook. Remember the large gentleman that wouldn't let me push him over? His daughter is going to do a very brilliant illustration for you in a moment. But I said to you before that when you don't have love and acceptance, there's a vacuum in your life, and you're going to draw something into a vacuum. If, if you're not whole within yourself, you're going to have your needs for love and acceptance filled somehow. You've got to have a sense of well-being. So this is what, when love is not communicated, it creates a vacuum out of which rejection grows. And anything that you take to fulfill the need in a love vacuum will become an idol or an object of worship. You need to know this, that only Jesus can ever be the one who makes you feel whole who can fill the love vacuum in your life. No human being can ever do it. And when we do not have a, a, when we are not whole, and we have a love vacuum, we will try and fill it with people. So now, Bailey, where are you? Over to you. Can I have a mic? Uh, I'll hold this microphone for you. Um... I did an illustration at the Pure Campaign, and Sally Jo was, in fact, thrown in the bin, but my mom made a new one for me yesterday because she's amazing. So, this is Jo, and this is Sally, okay? Now, Jo, Jo's like, for a boy, his arms are quite skinny, and Sally, for a girl, her shoulders are a little bit broad, but... They, they're not perfect, but they are whole, okay? So we've, we've joined them together in holy matrimony, and now they're called Sally Jo. And this is who they are. They're, they're married. So everything that Sally Jo puts into their relationship, if we had like a little piece cut out here, if I put things in to Sally Jo, they would stay inside him or her, it. They would stay inside because it's, they're both whole, Okay, I want to show you that two halves make a whole just now. But this is whole Sally, and this is whole Joe. And whatever we put in, will stay in. Anything good you put into the relationship will stay in, because that's just the way it is, okay? And I have another, I have a half of Sally Joe. This is Joe. This is Sally. They've got small problems. They, um, they're not whole people. They're like, they suffer a little bit from rejection, in fact, because um, they lost half of themselves. So this, this is how two halves, because you've got a half of Joe and half of Sally, and they make a hole. And you see this massive hole. <laughs> That's what it makes. Not like two halves make a... Sorry. Okay, here it is. But I have some stuff to stuff half Sally Joe with. I'll just put it under my armpit. If you just make it louder, then it'll be easier. Thanks, girl. <laughs> okay, this is what Sally Joe are putting into their relationship. It's good stuff. It's the same stuff that's in that Sally Joe. They can get as much of this as they really like. Let's find the hole, the in hole. Here it is. And we've got, we've got like a whole packet of this, this good stuff to put into this relationship. Whole packets. But it kind of just stays like a half 
Because until you like close the gap, until you until you make this Sally Joe into a whole Sally Joe, like it's just gonna be a little bit messy. So that's it. I think that is absolutely brilliant. It's it's sad if you can clean it later. They don't just remind us. Let it be a reminder. That has just been a real graphic illustration of what I'm talking about. Because when you are home and you don't have a vacuum within you, when you go into a relationship with somebody and they affirm you or whatever, whatever it is that they're doing, they're giving you time, they're giving you affirmation, you're having fun together, and all of that just goes in and it builds the relationship. The problem is if you're not home, no human being has the capacity to fill that hole within you. Nobody does. Because the other person is finite. And it means that we can only give as much as we have the energy to give, as much as we have the emotional capacity to give, as much as we have the time to give, and remembering that we have needs of our own. And so when you have a, a half person with a big hole in them, you can take all the stuff that Bailey so, so graphically showed us, and you can give that person time, you can give them attention, you can tell them you love them, you can do all kinds of nice things, but it is never, ever going to fill the void. There's just never going to be enough. They're going to want more and more and more and more, because as fast as you put it in, so it drains out, because it is a vacuum. So when you try and fill a love vacuum with people, this is what you need to know. No human can ever fill a love vacuum. The person who has a love vacuum tends to want to draw people into this vacuum and suck the life out of them. And that is, remember I told you at the beginning of the last lecture how I had that back on my back, ah. you know, and I had to look at it, I said, oh my Lord, this is what is on me. This is who I am. I have such a need such an incredible need for attention, for somebody to pay attention to me, to make me feel as if they care about me. But I was, I was really almost out of my mind. The rejection was so bad. And so when I had a relationship with somebody, I would become so intensely dependent upon them that I would need their attention. It was like they couldn't get away. I was busy strangling the life out of them, trying to draw my needs out of them. Um, and in a love vacuum, when there's a love vacuum in a marriage, and this is a really, really, really bad thing, when you're in a marriage and there is a problem with rejection, because this is what happens in a marriage. The spouse can become totally smothered. But why? It's because here you are as an unwhole person, a half person, and you want your spouse. You're going, it's your job to make me happy. It is your job to give me a sense of well-being. I need your time and attention. And we begin to be extremely demanding of the partner. And you know, you cannot demand love from somebody any more than you can demand submission. Because once you start demanding submission, it's not submission anymore, it's subjection and domination. And once you try and once you demand love, it's not love that's given anymore. It's something that's given out of manipulation and it's not love. And so the spouse can become completely smothered where, where the partner will draw all the life out of that other person to meet their needs. Or the spouse can become worshipped. You know, you'll do anything for them because that's the center of your life. You're actually worshipping them. They've become an idol. So you'll do anything for them. You'll serve them in any way in order to get your needs met. Then, and this is the worst of all, is the spouse becomes enslaved. And I have seen this more times than I can tell you, where demands are made that cannot be met. And then there's a reaction of hatred and jealousy um, where, where pa marriage partners can become so angry towards anybody or anything that takes their partner away from them because they need all of them. I need all of you. 
I need you. And there's an enslavement that happens. And you know, often it's just emotional blackmail and it can operate in guilt. And the person with a love vacuum becomes jealous and possessive, domineering and has a controlling spirit. They'll demand the other person's attention constantly. And if this is denied, they feel rejected. It becomes a one-way relationship with one person giving and the other receiving. And you know what? This can happen with marriage partners. It can happen with parents and children. It can happen with friends. You know, if you are in a relationship and you feel, listen to me, if you're in a relationship and you feel guilty, if you're doing something else, you're giving your time elsewhere, if you're in a friendship, and you feel you don't dare go off to a movie with somebody in case this friend reacts because you didn't invite them to. You've got a problem. And um, I've said the NB, don't allow the needs of another person to control you, and you can add to that, or you will become a slave. Don't allow the needs of another person to control you, or you will become a slave. Parents can do this to their children. Very, very easily. J. John, who is just a, a really, really good speaker from England, we're going to be showing a DVD of his this week, this um, Sunday evening. Said this. He, uh, he said his mother was a Greek. Is a, is a ho I, do, I hope she's dead, because um, <laughs> I really do. Otherwise, she might get really upset if she sees her son on television saying this. He said, "You know, I love my mother, but I don't like her." He said, we can love people and not like them. And he said, she's a travel agent for guilt trips. And I found that hilarious. You know, I was really waiting to hear what kind of travel agent she was. And then when he said guilt trips, I understood totally. Um, and that is what happens in a, in a love vacuum if you try to put people into it. You, need, you know, I remember a young couple that were in America that were engaged and um, I nearly destroyed my friendship with the guy, I did actually for a few years, because I tried to stop him marrying her. And I said to him, you are setting yourself up for a problem here, because this girl has such intense rejection problems that if you, if you don't give her your attention 24-7, uh, she's going to react. Because he would be sitting talking to people, and she would like take his hand, and she'd want him to stroke her, or this was while they were still engaged, or she would, she, just the demands that oozed out of her. And so he got very, very cross with me, and he married her, and he never came and apologized, and he should have, because what I said happened. But anyway, they're still married, and she's still demanding, and he's still giving, and God bless him. Okay, but the point is that when you, be very careful who you marry. Do you hear me? Be careful who you marry. Because marriage is supposed to be something of equal partnership, where you're mature enough to be able to give, and you don't go into that thing looking to have your needs met. Any person who says to you, it's your job to make me happy, has a problem. Other things that come into rejection vacuums, if we don't try and fill them with people, which is the worst, we can try and fill them with goals and things. Pleasure, where you, you just go from one holiday to another or one toy to another because you want to feel good. This is the basic problem. We all want to feel good. And if we, if we aren't home, we need something external to make us feel good, whereas we should be able to feel good just within ourselves because God loves us and we love him. And we can just enjoy living and enjoy being who we are. That is wholeness. But when we can't, it means that we've got to always find something external to make us happy. And if it's not a person, then we might try it by looking for pleasure continually. You know, going from one exciting thing to another. We can try and make our career make us feel good. Or intellectualism, you know, pursuing intellectual pursuits. Promiscuity, sleeping with everybody. But let me, tell, let me tell you this, that a physical relationship will never, ever satisfy the rejection vacuum, and you never. Possessions indicate success. Career gives acceptance. Intellectualism gives recognition. So people, if it's not a person that you're trying to make you feel good, it can be goals and things, or you can become totally self-centered. You become your own God. And you're on a quest for pleasure. You've got to satisfy yourself constantly. 
You, in, you can just be somebody who becomes a sex addict, where lust and perversion is the thing. That's the only thing that, that gives you any sense of gratification. Um, and if you can't receive love emotionally or spiritually, the body becomes the instrument by which love is given or received. But let me tell you this, that sex without commitment will always produce more rejection. Marriage is there to protect the sexual relationship. But what happens is a girl is so desperate, just so desperate to be wanted, to be loved, to be accepted, and her boyfriend pressures her so she sleeps with him. And before very long, he leaves and he moves on to another girl and she's left even more fragmented than she was before because now she's given everything and he's gone. And that undermines her sense of, of value. So she does it again and again and again. Or the other way around. A guy really wants to know that she loves him, and the only way he's going to know that is if she sleeps with him. And then she drops him. Do you know that when you have these family murders, when a, a, when a relationship breaks up and a partner cannot accept the fact that they've been left, so they'll go out and murder the person who's left them, why do you think that happens? It's because that they cannot cannot be abandoned again. They cannot be left. That, that sense within them of, of, of wholeness is being taken away and the emotions just can't sustain it. Um, and you can even fill your, your rejection vacuum with religion. Some people, unfortunately, minister out of a need to be needed. They continually ministering to people, prophesying to people, praying for people, because they want to be needed. And let me tell you this, that what true ministry does is it makes people independent of you. You link them to God so that it's them and God, not you and them and God. But many people will minister out of a need to be needed. And then the, the other result is a position seeker. A person who has a love vacuum seeks a position of leadership because that's where he gets his self-worth. He'll find it difficult to be a servant because it gives him no self-worth. People who want titles, or they want to be boss of something, or they want to be given a position of recognition, they'll seek position because that makes them feel good about who they are. But you know that we, if we know who we are, we don't need people looking up to us and admiring us and thinking how great we are. We're able to be unseen and unknown because we don't get our sense of well-being from being recognized or from having people think how great we are. And you know, I know exactly of what I'm, of what I'm speaking because the rejection that was in my life was so extreme that the attention I needed was so, in, was so, you know, I just so wanted people to make me feel as if I was worth something, that I used to do the most extreme things just to get attention. Really, the, the story I, I frequently tell is the way I would injure myself just because I wanted people to be worried about me. And I remember actually taking a big rock and balancing it on top of a door and walking in and out and pulling the door shut so the rock would fall on my head so it would knock me out so somebody would find me and there would be a big drama because I was concussed and bleeding and, they would ha and everybody would come and fuss because I was hurt. And I, and I did things like that, even when I was a teacher. I remember going in over the weekend and actually rigging up a thing on top of my cupboard with charts and things on top of it so that at an appropriate moment when all the kids were there, I could pull it down, everything would fall on my head and I'd be knocked out. I've come a long way. You know? I've come a long way. You're going to come a long way. Let's stand. Then come, Jane. You know what the good news is, guys? If God could take somebody as messed up, as totally messed up as I was, with such extreme rejection, 
and so many, many issues. Thank you. <laughs> With so many issues. And, and bring me to a point where I don't mind, there is nothing in my life that I won't tell you. Because I don't need your approval or for you to think that I'm somebody great to feel okay about myself. I can tell you how totally unokay I am, and that's fine too. And that is wholeness. And that's what Possess the Land is all about. And next week, we're going to look at how to come out of rejection and how to get rid of hurts. And we're going to be praying during that, during the second lecture and trusting God to minister to you. So now, so that we do not go away feeling morbid, we are going to be happy, aren't we? <laughs>